bless you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mitchell, and to First Lady Mitchell, all the pastors and preachers in the house, to our deacon brothers, and of course to the chairpersons of this wonderful day and celebration, church anniversary and homecoming. Uh, and to each of you, it's good to be here. In the land of the dying, on our way to the land of the living. I'm certain you've already stopped to say to the Lord, thank you for him bringing us safe this far. You do know he didn't have to wake us this morning, but he did. That alone is enough to be thankful for. And then to have the privilege of being able to come to this wonderful place to worship God. We worship him because of who he is. We praise him because of what he has done. And God is so awesome until there are some things about God that God himself has never seen. God has never seen a situation that he could not solve. God has never seen a sinner that he could not save. God has never seen a substitute for his son. God has never seen a sinner that could save himself. David said, can I say something? I said, what do you want to say, David? He said, well, I have been young. And now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their seed begging for bread. It is such a joy to be here with Dr. Mitchell and his wife and this wonderful church. You have a tremendous pastor and outstanding. outstanding leader and my God he is a preacher and I thank God for him he's still young useful uh, still looking good preaching good it does not yet appear what God will do through this man's servant to bless the people of God I want to thank you pastor for this invitation to come I discovered a long time ago, people don't have to be nice. And when they are, they don't have to be nice to you. And when they're nice to you, you should at least show your appreciation. And so I am grateful. And then to be able to experience this kind of worship service, my God, I thought folks had forgot that we still love God. I heard Deacon praying just a little while ago. My God, he tore us up. And then this choir came behind us and said, there's a bright cloud somewhere. Hallelujah. <laughs> Come on, let's bless God for them. <laughs> Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. I saw several members of our church that's in this house. I'm so honored to see you all in here to share with us today. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will like him unto a wise man that build his house upon the rock. The rain descended, the flood came, the wind blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was built on a rock. And whosoever hears these sayings of mine and doeth them not, I will liken him unto a foolish man that built his house on the sand. The rain descended, the flood came, the wind blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Thank you so much. Thank you. You can pick a subject that you want to use with this and tell me about it after service and I'll use it 
the next time. <laughs> Scholars say to us that whenever you teach any lesson, that you should never begin a conversation in the middle of a conversation. Because when you do that, it is like a person passing a door and you hear a statement while passing and you draw a conclusion upon the statement. And most time, all you can do is use your imagination because you don't have proper information. But because the passage is deep, yet it is shallow. It is deep enough for scholars to dive in and never reach the bottom yet it is shallow enough for babies to swim in and never drown. It should be enough in the text to help us understand the text. He opened this passage by saying, therefore. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to know if somebody starts something by saying, therefore, that's not the beginning of the conversation. That something happened before the therefore. Scholars also say that when you study the word of God, you should seek out the verbs of the text because the verb is where the action is. Then they say that not only should you seek out the verbs, but find the subject of the sentence. And if you read a sentence that there is no subject, you become a subject of the sentence. For instance, in Galatians chapter 5, uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, be not drunk with wine, where in its excess be filled with the Spirit. And since there's no subject in the sinners, you become the subject. Who should be filled? It should be you. But then many times there's another passage or way of watching the text, and that's watching the conjunctions in the text. Conjunctions in a passage in the Bible is like cement between brick walls. Most of the time when you pull up and see the building, you see the bricks, but pay the cement no attention. But it's the cement that keep the bricks in order. It is the conjunctions that keep the sinners flowing and in order. There are different kinds of conjunction. That's what I call a contrast conjunction. Contrast conjunction is when the sentence is flowing in one way, but when you get to the conjunction, it sends you another way. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. It sends you another way. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1, 2, 3, and 4 read like this. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness have come up before me. Verse 3, but Jonah rose to flee unto Tasha, went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tasha, paid his fare thereof, and went down with them unto Tasha from the presence of the Lord. Verse 4, but God, that when your butt head in one direction, God has another butt to send you another way. That's a conjunction. That's what I call a contrast conjunction. That's a connecting conjunction. This word and normally it connects a promise with a principle. Most of us enjoy the promises of God but overlook the principles. But if you don't apply the principle, you will not experience the promise. Here's a promise in John 14, and I will pray. The Father, that he'll send another comforter that he may abide with us forever. He give us a promise that you can have access to all three of the Godheads. He said, I, that's the Son, will pray the Father, that's the Father. That he'll send another comforter, that's the Holy Ghost. It's the Son who prays, the Father to whom he pray, the Holy Spirit for whom he pray. You see, creation is God behind us. Bethlehem is God with us. Calvary is God for us. Pentecost is God in us. Donated at Bethlehem, demonstrated at Calvary, but illustrated at Pentecost. He said, you can have access to all three of the Godheads. But he said, now, since there's a promise, 
that's an and between the promise and the principle. The principle is this, John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray. But then there's another conjunction, if is a conjunction. And this little word if is sandwiched in the word life. You carry it with you everywhere you go. You spell life, L-I-F-E, drop the L off the front of the word life, E off the back of the word life, sandwich in the middle is an if. And it's scattered throughout the scripture. But one that I'm sure you're familiar with, that's Second Chronicles 7, 14, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then, will I hear from heaven, forgive them of their sins, and heal their land. That's a conjunction also, but therefore is a conjunction. Whenever you see the word therefore, most of the time you have to bag up to see what therefore is therefore. <laughs> you, you see therefore in Romans 12 and 1, I beseech ye therefore, Paul had spent 11 chapters telling us what God had done for us. And then when he get to chapter 12, he said, now what you going to do? Talk to me, somebody. He says the same thing in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Be ye therefore steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know, your labor is not in vain. He gave us 57 verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and tell you what Jesus did for us. And he take the last verse, he said, now it's your turn. So sometimes, therefore, deal with a verse, sometimes it deal with a chapter. But therefore, in Matthew chapter 7, you see, Matthew, the book of Matthew, is cut up in the segments. The first four chapters of Matthew deal with Jesus' human personality. You see, Jesus was human, but he was also divine. It came out when he was 12 years of age, he baffled the mind of the professors, and they said, little boy, how old are you? He said, take a moment for me to explain it. He said, because on my mother's side, I'm only 12. But on my father's side, I'm older than time. On my mother's side, I'm younger than man. But on my father's side, I made man. On my mother's side, I walked through the doors. But on my father's side, I am the door. On my mother's side, I ate some bread. But on my father's side, I'm the bread of life. On my mother's side, I drank a little water. But on my father's side, in me is a well of living water. On my mother's side, I clammed on vines. But on my father's side, I'm the true vine. So he was human, but he was also divine. And see, so he deal with human personalities. Chapter 1 of Matthew deal with Jesus' background. Because Genesis, Matthew 1 and 1 said, a book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. David had a son. Abraham had a son. Abraham's son was a sacrifice. David's son was a king. Jesus was born king, but he died a sacrifice. Chapter 1 deal with his background. Chapter 2 deal with his birth. Jesus was born with the aid of a woman without having the assistance of a man. See, the Lord fixed it from creation that a woman could be pregnant, could carry a baby nine months, Give the baby the vitamins, minerals, and nutrients, everything, but no blood. Talk to me, somebody. The blood always come from the male and never from the female. <laughs> uh, that's why if a man mess up and try not to own the child, somebody would say, you are the father. <laughs> Talk to me, somebody. He, he, he. Y'all hear me, don't you? It deal with Jesus' 
help me say his background deal with his birth chapter 3 deal with his baptism you see Jesus's baptism was similar to what happened in Chicago some years ago Babe Ruth was a great baseball player but he was a king baseball hitter it was the bottom of the name two outs two strikes Three balls, Babe was at the bat. They thought they had him, figured he wouldn't get out of this. But Babe Ruth took his bat and raised it and pointed where he was going to hit the ball. The pitcher wound up and sent him a curveball. Babe hit it, they hollered, it's going, it's going, it's gone, right where he pointed. When Jesus went in the water, he took his spiritual bat and pointed where he was going to hit the spiritual ball. Because when it went in the water, it symbolized his death. When it went under, it symbolized his burial. When it came up, it symbolized his resurrection. He hit the ball right where he pointed. Chapter 4, deal with his battle. Chapter 1, deal with his background. Chapter 2, deal with his birth. Chapter 3, deal with his baptism. Chapter 4, deal with his battle. You see, whenever God rises to bless us, Satan will rise to bless us. First, there was the dip. He went in the water. Then there was the dove ascending from heaven. Then there was the dialogue with the Father. Then came the devil. <laughs> Watch how Jesus handled the devil. He could have blew on him, knocked him from here, the kingdom's come. But he knew I couldn't handle the devil that way. So he dealt with the devil to show me how I'll have to deal with him. That's with the word. Matthew 4 and 4, he said, it's written. Matthew 4 and 7, he said, it is written. Matthew 14, and he said, it is written. Luke 4 and 4, he said, it is written. Luke 4 and 8, he said, it is written. Luke 4 and 12, he said, it is said. Mark 1 and 12, he said, it is written. He said, listen, I'm giving you what you need to be vict victorious over the devil. Chapter 1 through 4 deal with the human personality. Chapter 5 through 7 deal with helpful principles. Because Jesus says you need to know who you are before you can be successful. He said, ye are the salt of the earth. Huh. Sound like he's downplaying us. He said, you are the salt. What is salt good for? It flavor. Salt flavor. You don't hear me. Salt flavor situations. Uh, somebody walk in the room, confusion is everywhere. But when you're salt, you come the surroundings. Y'all don't like me in this house. And one person can come and say, Have y'all prayed yet? That's the salt of the earth. Talk to me, somebody. He said, you're the salt of the earth. But then he said, you are light. He said, I need you to know you're not tail lights, but headlights. Hmm. Our light ought to shine privately. Let your light so shine. That means the folks in the house ought to see it. But it also shine publicly that others might see your good work. And then it ought to be purposely and glorify the Father. That means when somebody look at you, they got to ask you how you do that. But you got to be able to answer them and say, it's not me. But it's something on the inside that won't let me hold my peace. You are salt of the earth. 
is the light of the world. Then it says, I need to teach you how not to worry. He said in Matthew 6, 25, take no thought. The Greek word is Miriam nao. Well, you get the word Miriam now, which means don't stress yourself out. Stress will take you out. Stress has a way of hardening your arteries. Stress calls your pressure to rise. Stress, y'all don't hear me, will cause you to have type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes mess with your immune system. When your immune system is low, it causes you to easily pick up diseases. And when you pick up diseases, that's a disease. Y'all don't like me. It's all because we stress ourselves out. Jesus said, take no thought for your life. That means your future. Or what you shall eat, that's your food. Yea, for your body, that's your fitness. Or what you shall put on, that's your fashion. Verse 19, chapter 6, lay not for yourself treasure, that's your finances. Five things cause us to stress out. Our future, our food, our fitness, our fashion, and our finances. The Lord said, don't worry about none of it. I knew where I was coming, so I sent him an email. I said, tell me why. He said, drop down to verse 33. But seek ye first. The kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things, your future, your food, your fitness, your fashion, your finances shall be added. you have a witness. He said, don't worry. But then he said something else and then I'll get to the text. He said, judge not. Matthew 7, 1, judge not. It's amazing how much it takes for a person to become a judge. You have to be good in school. After you get good in school, you have to go another eight years. Then you have to pass the bar exam. Then you have to be selected by your peers. And after you go through all that, there's certain things you can judge. In many cases, the judge can't make a ruling until the jury shows up. But in church, a person can see you one time and judge you. <laughs> You drive in with a new car, they've already figured out how you got it. Do I have a witness? After Jesus had finished teaching these, he concluded his message by saying, Therefore, whosoever heareth a kurma, for the word, hear it. Whosoever, Lord, hear it. Matthew 11 and 15, he that have ears to hear, let him hear. Hearing is important. So important to let one of the instruments God lets start working before you're born. While you're in your mother's womb, Eyes may not be fully developed, but ears are working. That's why you shouldn't hang around people that's using profanity when you're pregnant. Because the baby hear it. That's why some of them come out cursing when the baby, you wonder how they got that, they heard it. But not only your ears, the first instruments to start working, 
Before you're born, they're the last instruments that stop working before you die. When mommy is in a coma, ain't saying nothing, ain't nothing moving, she's still hearing. <laughs> Preach Reverend Ray. That's why you shouldn't plan the funeral standing over mama. She hear you. Haven't got any help in this house. Hearing is important. Why is it so important? Because that's how you build your faith through hearing. Romans 10, 17 says, faith come by hearing. Hearing come through by the word of God. That's why when you come to church, find a good place to sit. So you won't have folks around you trying to carry on conversation when the word is going forth because you get your faith through hearing. You ain't going to have no faith if you don't hear. Whosoever heareth these sayings, we word for saying is the word logos. It is the word of God. Two Greek words for the word. Word, one is logos. The other is rhema. And remember, word come from a thought. God had a thought. But I don't know what he's thinking. So for me to know what he's thinking, he put his thought in the words. <laughs> Second Timothy 3.16, all scriptures given by the inspiration, Greek words, they are prenuma. Theos is the Greek word for God. Numa is where you get the word wind, breath, and spirit. The word is the breath of God. In other words, the word live. Y'all don't hear me in this house. It live. Help me say it live. The word is universal in its appeal, it's reasonable in its teaching, reliable in its promise, doable in its conflict, far reaching in its vision, accurate in its prophecy, simple in its application, new and modern in its statesmanship. But you have to read it to be wise, you have to believe it to be saved, you have to practice it to be holy. It's appealed from staff, a pilot's compass, a Christian chariot, and a soldier's sword. 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 in the New, 1,189 chapters, 31,214 verses, 773,746 words, 3,566,480 letters in the Word. Do I have a witness? There is the Logos. But then there is also the rhema. The Logos. John 1 and 1 in the beginning was the word. That's the Logos. Matthew 4 and 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. That's the rhema. The rhema worked from the Logos. You see, Lord, when I, I want something from God, I got a daughter that everywhere I go, she called me. Every morning, 8 o'clock, check on me. See if I'm all right. Traveling, much as I do sometimes, I miss her. Next time I talk with her, she get a little fast with me. <laughs> she said, Dad, I'm going, Lord, to get another daddy. <laughs> I called you, you didn't call me back. I said, but baby, I text you. <laughs> Read the text. Sometime... You call God, and God don't answer. God said, but I text you. <laughs> Lord, I, I, I needed some help. I, I, I called you, and you didn't show up. He said, but I text you. Psalms 121, verse 1, I lift up my eyes unto the hills from which come at my help. My help comes from the Lord. Let me get out of here. Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine 
and do it them. I will liken unto him of a man that build his house. Uh, now, the Bible talks about house, Joshua 24, 15, if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day as to whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Isaiah 38, 1, thus said the Lord, set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. John 14, 2, in my father's house of many mentions. 2 Corinthians 5 and 1, and we know that if this earthly house of this tabernacle where it is are, we have a building of God, a house, Lord, none made by hand. He said, you need to know that every time you hear the word, you're building your house. He said, now, you got to be careful with the house you're building because you got to live in the house. <laughs> I got to let y'all go. He said, uh, one build on a rock. Lord, uh, now, another man was building a house, but he built his on sand. Now, 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 that's a lot of stuff common with rocks and sand. Matter of fact, they come from the same family. But a rock is sand organized. Sand is rock unorganized. Rock means I'm building for the future. Sand means I'm building for right now. Y'all don't hear me. <laughs> you see, you got too many folks looking at life just for right now. But can I tell you, you got to build with the future in mind. Y'all don't hear me in this house. Yeah. Now, it's Luke that says, uh, Luke 6, uh, 48 said, he dig deep. Lord, uh, while the man building on sand was laying his foundation, the man digging on, building on rock was digging deep. While the man building on sand was going up with the walls, the man building on the rock was digging deep. The man building on sand, now putting the roof on. But the man building on rock, still digging. Man building on sand, Lord have mercy. Huh? He's putting his plumbing, his electrical work in there. But the man building on a rock, still digging. You know, you got some folk that just show up at church every now and then. That's building on sand. But when you're building on a rock, you're still digging. You show up at prayer service. You show up at Bible study. Because you build in the, with the future in mind. Have I got a witness here? Finally, Lord, uh, the house was complete. <laughs> the one on sand, uh, oh Lord, uh, and the one on the rocks. <laughs> Evidently, they lived in the same community because the Bible said the rain came. That meant something <laughs> was falling down on the house. But then it said the flood rose. <laughs> That meant something uh, was coming under the house. <laughs> and then it said the wind blew. <laughs> that meant something uh, was coming against the house. Uh, can I tell y'all today, uh, in this life, uh, you just don't know uh, what tomorrow is going to bring. Uh, rain. <laughs> Show will fall. Uh, am I talking to anybody here? Uh, ever experienced a little rain in your life? 
Anybody here ever had it rain on your life? But you were able to hold on. But then sometime stuff start coming up from on the underside. It knock your feet out from under your life. You ask yourself, how am I going to make it? But before you can straighten up, wind start blowing against you. Have I got to witness him? You know what I discovered? That there's always a lot of stuff to irritate you. Have I got a witness here? Because my God uh, already know how the outcome is going to be. And so what I discovered uh, is not what happened. Uh, it's how you look at what happened. When you're born again, uh, you discover that irritations uh, is just an invitation for an elevation. I'm out of here. Look at somebody say, neighbor. I don't know where you are today, but if things have started irritating you, tell them it's just an invitation for an elevation. Have I got a witness? And I'm through with y'all. The Bible said that when the flood was over, a little investigation took place. I think it was a news media that stopped by and went to the house that was still standing. He knocked on the door. Nobody responded. He knocked again and nobody responded. He rung the doorbell and there was no answer. And then he hollered from the outside. Is there anybody in the house? A voice from the inside hollered just a minute. A man came to the door with his pajamas on, with his stocking cap. He said, can I help y'all? The news media said, well, a storm came through last night. And we wanted to see if there were any survivors. The man said, well, why did you knock at my door? The news media said, well, your house is the only one that's still standing. Every other house has fallen by the way. Tell us how is it that you're still standing? The man said, well, I read the weather report. The weather report said a man born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. So I laid my foundation so when the storm comes oh, I'm out of here. Oh, I'll be able to Able. Is he all right? Shake somebody's hands and neighbor. I'm a survivor. I'm a survivor. I've been in stone. I made it. I'm a survivor. 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 I'm a